Today we are meeting here uh, to basically hear Professor Ijaz Ahmed and the occasion for that is the publication by Leftward Books of um, the new mole, uh, the parts of the Latin American left by Amir Sadr. Um, now this is a book that was first published by Verso uh, and, and we are doing the Indian, uh, Indian edition of it. Uh, so after the after the talk, conversation, etc., you can pick up your uh, your copies if you so wish. Uh, so let's uh, let's begin with with the book itself. Um, and uh, as we well know, there's a whole lot of literature uh, available on what's unfolding right now uh, in Latin America, both from the left and from the right perspectives. Uh, what do you think sets Amir Sadar's book apart from? a whole lot of other literature. Um, I, in my view, Amir Sader and Eduardo Galeano are the two most important intellectuals in Latin America. Uh, one from Hispanic America, one, one from Brazil. Uh, secondly, I think in the English language, great deal of literature is available uh, on Latin America. Most of it, and, and some very good literature, is available. Um, most of it is about particular countries, about particular histories, particular this. There are three general books available in English, I believe, which are uh, seminal books. Uh, the first one uh, was uh, The Open Veins of Latin America by Eduardo Galeano. And the second, I think, was uh, <coughs> Grandin's book. Uh, Latin America Empire's Workshop, and uh, the third one in the English language, I believe, is the New Mall. <coughs> um, the one of the what sets this book apart from both of those, both of them, very very important books, is that those books tell us what has been done to Latin America by imperialism, primarily the United States. Uh, and so on. Uh, this is the book that, in fact, summarizes um, the dynamics for revolutionary aspiration and radical change in Latin America. I think it's the most succinct account available in uh, the English language, which takes this whole sort of view. And Amir Sader brings to it 50 years of direct involvement. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> he was the man who, when um, um, Chavez went to Brazil for to address the World Social Forum, uh, um, uh, Amir Sader was the person who basically organized that reception from by the MST, by the uh, very famous reception, and so on. Uh, so his, his very close involvement in the revolutionary processes, uh, not only in Brazil, <coughs> but all over Latin America, certainly Venezuela and Bolivia. So, uh, and it's a very fine book, it's extremely well written, we can talk about the contents of the book. It's a short summary of Latin American history really of the last 60, 70 years, if not before. So it's, a, it's I think, a wonderful book. I offer one minor correction, that it was not first published by Verso, it was published in English for the first time by Verso. Right. Okay. <laughs> first it was published in 2009 in, uh, in uh, Portuguese in, in Brazil, 2011 in, uh, by Verso in English, right. and now we have done it. Right. right. As I have the most immediate context of, of this conversation, is of course um, Chavez's recent win in Venezuela, right. and to my mind, there are at least, I mean, there's a whole lot that that can be said about it. But what what struck me most immediately uh, were at least three important things. One is of course the margin of the victory, which you know, 11 percent. Uh, now, in any other country, in any other, <laughs> in any Western democracy for instance, this would be considered a landslide. And, uh, and for Chavez, uh, I mean, given his previous victory, which was 25 percent um, margin, 
this was considered something of a close, um, not a close call, but a, a, a much closer margin. Um, then um, what struck me also was the fact that for the first time in Venezuela, we have had an opposition that has tried to position itself not from the right wing as being right wing opponents of Chavez, but in some senses trying to position themselves as um, in a sense the more authentic uh, left um, or trying to attack Chavez from something of a left wing kind of a position. Um, um, and thirdly, that, that after the verdict, um, uh, the verdict has not been challenged by the opposition unlike in the past and unlike in the past again there has been no violence on the streets. Now, what does all of this and, and the other sort of processes in Venezuela, what does that tell us about what is happening there? You are absolutely right, 11% uh, is a very, very convincing margin of victory uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, for Chavez, it is uh, supposed to be a decline. Uh, <clears throat> I think it is very important to realize that in all of these left-oriented governments in that, that have come into being in uh, Latin America, uh, Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, and uh, to a lesser extent leftist in Argentina, and even less <laughs> of a leftist one in Brazil. Brazil. In uh, all of them, uh, n none of them have nationalized the media, have taken over the media. The media continues to be in the hands of the oligarchy. And secondly, expropriation of private wealth has been minimal. What has been nationalized in very many, in, in, in several cases, is the national resources. Oil, um, gas, uh, <clears throat> now uh, takeover of part of banking in Argentina, things of that kind. Um, but not expropriation of wealth. So any election has to be fought against this oligarchic media, very powerful, as well as immense amounts of private wealth. Okay, so that's that's one thing we have to understand what you're up against, uh, and that media is just. Uh, I've been to Venezuela. I've, I know that media that is just ruthless. Uh, um, anyway, I, I won't go into that. So that's one thing that that you're up against a lot. <coughs> Secondly, I would say that behind the reduced margin is the fact that I think <laughs> I read it in a very particular way. Uh, all the political forces ranged against Hugo Chavez and his particular way of building socialism. Uh, united against one candidate. One reason why the margins were so much greater in the past was that the opposition was very much more disunited and fractious. Even when they would formally unite, they would not actually work together and so on. So this is actually a sense of despair on the part of the left, on the, of, of the right opposition that our only chance of winning against him or even mounting a credible challenge is if we all unite together. Uh, so this is the first time that they put up one united candidate and actually worked for him. Thirdly, the candidate himself. Uh, he is a very upper class fellow. He was the mayor of one of the richest um, townships er in Caracas, uh, <clears throat> very wealthy. He's very much a representative of the oligarchy. The fact that he tried to position himself as a center-left candidate, uh, <clears throat> I will cut off the subsidies for uh, all these oil subsidies that uh, uh, Chavez is uh, 
offering to Brazil and Argentina and countries of the Caribbean and so on. Uh, we don't need to do any of that. But I will keep the social programs. I'll just make them more inclusive. Right now, these social programs benefit only the followers of Chavez. I'll make them more inclusive, things of that sort. Positioning of himself as a center-left ca candidate, completely oligarchic coalition. This, to my mind, is a, an evidence that after 12, 13 years, sh the Chavistas now occupy hegemonic ground. Even the oligarchs have to speak the language of center-left. They can no longer go on speaking their own language. Their language has been taken away from them. And this is, as uh, Amir Sadar very beautifully says in his book, One Place, that the three great monopolies in the world yeah. are arms, finance, and words. <coughs> um, <coughs> that monopoly in Venezuela has been broken. So it really is a hegemonic pressure forcing the oligarchs to speak the center left language. Um, <coughs> there was something else you were asking? Um. Margin of victory? Margin of victory and and the fact that after, after the elections there's yeah. been very violence. Uh, violence as well as the yeah. Yeah. almost easy uh, kind of acceptance. <coughs> of the fact of the matter is that the, there was fear of violence from both sides. Right. Not from the Chavistas but from the left. Look, Jimmy Carter, whose Carter Center has uh, not supervised but observed 92 elections in the world, makes two statements in a period of two weeks. It's quite extraordinary. I mean, the Carter Center won a Nobel Prize for this, for their work. He says on the one hand that the Venezuelan electoral process is the best in the world. In the world. And two weeks later he says that the electoral process in the United States has been distorted by money to such a degree that any kind of democratic whatever that uh, money has just completely ruined the democratic process in the United States. Anyway, <clears throat> more than 200 credible organizations from all over the world watching that, those elections, all over the country. The, I, I won't go into these machines which uh, the, uh, the Venezuelans are now using. Uh, completely foolproof. You cannot then charge fraud. 11% is convincing enough. Had it been 2%, 1%, it would be a different matter. But again, I would say that, that this is hegemony. Over a period of 12 years, through God knows how many elections, not just elections, elections and referendums, he keeps winning, he keeps winning, he keeps winning by all these margins. And the world keeps certifying that the process is, is entirely um, fair. You finally, the oligarchs learn that crying wolf doesn't work anymore. And if you use violence now, you only do damage to yourself. You, you can't do damage to your Shavistas. Um, <clears throat> so that is, that is why there has been neither charges of fraud nor charges of um, no, no, uh, violence. That young man, is he's 40 years old. He knows that all the elder oligarchs uh, will go. And uh, he has time on his side. He'll come back to fight another election four or five years later. Uh, maybe he'll, uh, Hugo Chavez will still be there to fight that, that election, or he may have to fight that election against someone else. In a different context, I remember you were once saying that um, 
that liberal democracy is a form of organized crime. Um, this is one of the two primary forms of organized crime. Right. But here, not just in Venezuela, but in fact across the continent, there seems to be a slightly different picture emerging. We all have to go through the crime. And we have to win the battle of the crime. And the left can win these battles. You don't have a choice but to fight it. Do you have a choice? You think Maoists are going to make it? I doubt it. <laughs> You're a party to the crime. This is the greatest success that capitalism has. <clears throat> and this is a thing on which Marxist theory from Gramsci onwards has been struggling with this fact. How do you make a revolution once a bourgeois subjectivity has been created among the masses who come to believe in this particular form of um, representation? And this thing, you know, I mean, I, I really believe that in our time it has become the, the biggest organized crime in the world, uh, <clears throat> other than uh, capitalism itself. Uh, <clears throat> but this is a constant theme in uh, uh, Marxist and leftist uh, theory, actually, from Marx onwards. Mar Marx's very first major work, critique of Hegel's um, doctrine uh, <clears throat> of, of riot, um, engages actually precisely with this question. Um, these forms of representation, this claim of the, of the bourgeois state to be represented. Um, and yet this is what you have to go through. Corporate capital is a form of crime. Workers have to work in their factories. <coughs> Nothing you can do about it. <laughs> um, there's a lovely um, little instance that um, Amir Sadr um, cites in his book where he says that in 2001, I think it was, uh, at some meeting of uh, heads of states of Latin America, Fidel Castro passes a note to, to Chavez saying, um, you know, I'm glad I'm not the only devil in this room anymore. Right? Um, and in fact, I mean, in the last, what, maybe a dozen years, actually, the picture has changed completely. In other words, now you find that there are many, many devils um, um, across Latin America. And, and the continent, from being, uh, in a sense, uh, sort of a workshop for neoliberalism, um, um, a laboratory uh, for neoliberalism, has, in some senses, uh, transformed itself into being a crucible for experiments against neoliberalism. Um, could you speak a little bit about this larger continental shift and also what do these experiments actually comprise of? Fidel said uh, to a friend of mine uh, who, had, who had interviewed, uh, who was interviewing Fidel, Fidel said to him very early in 2004, 2005, <clears throat> that Venezuela is the first break we have got. So this friend asked him, well, what about Chile? And he said, well, had it lasted another five years, and had it arrived at a superior stage, it might have become a break for us. In other words, it's not that, it, that they killed him or uh, put an end to that, but that the, point at which it had arrived yeah. was not a breakthrough for <clears throat> already. This is the first break. And in that sense, ultimately, he's the only devil. Maybe Bolivia, I doubt if the rest of them are really devils in that sense. And the difference is the kind of revolutionary process um, that is being attempted organizationally at the base in, uh, in Venezuela. 
uh, organizing the base, organizing in the barrios, in the uh, <clears throat> communities of the poorest of the poor, the kind of that is a different kind of process. Um, and um, that is unique. You don't have that kind of thing, uh, in, even in the case of Bolivia, where in fact more and more of the social movements that were the, the base for um, Morales are coming in, in conflict with him, uh, and so on, and, and uh, mass is... Uh, uh, all right, uh, uh, all right. Uh, the, the, ba the, the background to it, in fact, I should talk more uh, systematically on this, but let me just clarify this point. That the background to it is that when the elections came, the first elections, when Morales was elected in Bolivia, uh, <clears throat> it was an ad hoc coalition of a huge number of social movements, movements of the indigenous, various kinds of movements, uh, which gave his political party, MAS, uh, the weight to win the elections. Okay. Uh, now, very many of those are now coming uh, in conflict with the Morales government. And the essential conflict is between um, uh, rights of ecology and needs of development. Uh, we can we can talk about that, but anyway, all right. So, what kind of uh, uh, experiments are these? Uh, and that uh, phrase, which we at some point can discuss, uh, socialism of the twenty first century. Again, the one devil who has a coherent vision of it is Chavez. And he has it, now it has become his own, but he has it precisely because he took it from the real devil. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things about Chavez is his very close relationship with Fidel. And it's very interesting that uh, Fidel would want this kind of a revolutionary process in, in, uh, in uh, Venezuela. Uh, <clears throat> And it's an integrated one. Um, first, you have to go through the liberal democratic process. And you, in order to do that, you have to deliver as fast as you can to keep expanding the loyalty of the base. How do you do this? Three or four different things. In Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, the constitution itself has been rewritten and passed through referendums. They fought elections on that with that promise and they implemented that promise. And into the Constitution is written what you might call a social contract, what the state must do for the people, very elaborate set of promises. So the programmatic vision, the basis for it, has actually been incorporated in the Constitution. That's one, one thing. Uh, and then you look at the actual record, and on the way, uh, Brigitte and I were talking about it, and I was saying that, all right, Chavez talks about socialism of the 21st century. Uh, well, uh, Mrs. Kirshner does not, nor did Nestor, uh, her husband, when he was the, uh, the. And yet, they have both basically achieved in terms of delivering to the people, essentially the same thing. Dramatic uh, rise 
um, in incomes at the lowest 40 percent, um, I mean, incomes for the lowest 40 percent of the population. Uh, <coughs> dramatic decline of poverty, even more dramatic decline for absolute poverty. Something like 70 percent of the of absolute poverty, according to government statistics in both countries, um, um, seems to have. I mean, it is, seems to have fallen by about 70 percent. Uh, the, um, the international agencies' figures are somewhat different. They they say about 40 percent, but that's very impressive already. So you have that incomes. Then, what what you would call a social wage, not only money incomes, but health, housing, education, transport, the social goods that you require to live a secure life. Visible expansion of it. Various kinds of experiments, um, health. Dramatic. I mean, the Venezuelans are actually um, paying for um, Cuban doctors all over Latin America. Uh, <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of people have got free eye operations and this operation and that operation. When I mean, I've seen this in Caracas, uh, the kind of. And, and they, that is all based in communities and barrios and uh, poor neighborhoods and so on. Uh, <clears throat> around that and then involving the masses of people in the process of actually building this infrastructure of change. Uh, lesser or greater degree, this is what has happened in each one of them. And therefore, each one of them has won elections very convincingly, re-elections with convincing margins. Korea and Ecuador and Morales, the Kirshners, first the husband, then Mrs. Mrs. Kirshner, and then Lula won two elections, and then um, <clears throat> after that Dilma, her, his uh, successor, uh, won the elections. One. Second, um, the vision of a Latin American integration. Practical implementation of it. Um, Cuba has a lot of petroleum. Petroleum is given to a variety of countries, all the members of ELBA, the, organi the organization of these countries, at subsidized prices. Um, when, you know, the takeoff from great crisis in when Nestor uh, Kirchner took over in Argentina, uh, and uh, there was a whole question of debt, and uh, Argentines were going to re did repudiate the IMF debt. Uh, Venezuela bought one billion dollars worth of debt, one billion, hundred billion. I forget <laughs> what the <laughs> some amazing uh, magnitude of the debt that they bought. This kind of thing, and now a banco. Uh, they're creating a bank uh, which in their vision will replace the IMF. Um, the uh, Now you have, this is very interesting, uh, now the latest is a new organization of 33 Latin American and Caribbean countries which have come together in an organization whose next meeting will be in Havana and Cuba therefore would be chairing it this whole year. Now remember Organization of American States, right, under the, the US, uh, <clears throat> where keeping Cuba out was the big thing. Now you have the entire continent going to, going to Havana uh, in Latin American solidarity. Uh, <clears throat> economic integration and uh, integrations of various sorts. Therefore, a practical shape for anti-imperialism. 
Now, Chavez is saying that they will build a gas and oil pipeline across the continent, up to the Pacific, where they will deliver petrol and gas for Asian trade, basically means China, and reorient their economies as much away from North America as possible. Economic integration of Latin America as against North America. So very elaborate and very practical ways of dissociating yourself from American hegemony. It's a long-term process uh, in which they are all participating. Uh, so it's a kind of a unity of the progressive forces across a very large part of Latin America, not all of Latin America. They are reactionary regimes, but uh, some of the biggest countries, Argentina, Brazil, uh, the wealthiest, Venezuela. Venezuela now, it turns out, has more oil than Saudi Arabia. Uh, so a struggle over Venezuela is a struggle over an enormous amount of wealth. Uh, who's going to win the elections means who's going to control this enormous wealth. Uh, <clears throat> so integration of all, all of this and a very clear-headed sense that a process of North American, European, but primarily North American domination of the continent, which has been built for the last 200 years, cannot be undone easily or quickly. Um, and it cannot be undone by closing yourself up in some autarchic world of your own. That it really is a struggle, it's a, it's a war of position in that sense. So Latin American integration, some very similar processes going on in all of them. And you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Precisely when Europeans are imposing upon their working classes, upon their lower middle classes, 50% or more of their populations in country after country, certainly in southern part of Europe, a kind of poverty that Europe has not known in, I don't know, 78 years, 100 years. Certainly not since the Second World War. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the kind of poverty you now have in, not only just in Greece, but in countries like Spain, uh, in the name of austerity, the perfection of neoliberalism of the worst sort. Precisely at that time, what you have in these Latin American countries is the absolutely the opposite model. Um, I was just looking at Frontline that uh, Jyoti, uh, Jyoti Ghosh has written a, an article which is, has the title on Argentina, wage-led growth. Exactly. You raise the wages. You go for full em employment. The state takes over, takes charge of um, the uh, national resources, um, builds a social state. Uh, increases the social wage, etc. Precisely at th this time, when um, advanced capitalism is going in the opposite direction. And that is happening in country after country, and that is what the cement is. I'll read a quote from Slavoj Žižek, uh, who first talks about how um, already the promise of 2011-2012 has basically um, you know, disintegrated in some senses. The whole Occupy movement uh, uh, is going nowhere. The Arab Spring uh, has resulted in sort of fundamentalists of various hues coming um, um, into power. He talks about how in Venezuela you have basically a populist clique led by uh, Chavez and um, in, um, um, in Greece the increase the defeat of 
of Syriza and so on. And then he ends the article by saying that the main victim of the ongoing crisis is does not capitalism, which appears to be evolving into an even more, uh, even more pervasive and pernicious form, but democracy, not to mention the left, whose inability to offer a viable global alternative has again been rendered visible to all. It was the left that was effectively caught with its pants down. It is almost as if this crisis was staged to demonstrate that the only solution to a failure of capitalism is more capitalism. Uh, it appears to me that this is an excessively uh, bleak and, and pessimistic outlook of the world today. In the current issue of Social Scientist, I have published the text of a lecture I gave in Calcutta. Three returns to Marx, Derrida, Badieu and Zizek. Um, the real answer to this is actually in that article. <laughs> um, Zizek is a very peculiar character. He has a lot of this Leninist bluster. Um, but when he comes down from that Leninist bluster of his, which is a way of legitimating your position on the left or something. Um, <clears throat> it's quite extraordinary what he says, what you need to really fight for yeah. um, <clears throat> or fight against. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, uh, look. I was, I had two weeks of excitement about the so-called Arab Spring. I certainly did. Two at the most, three weeks of excitement. <clears throat> and after that, it became quite clear um, um, that it was a very dangerous moment in the life of the Arab peoples. Uh, <clears throat> So that, I never thought there was much of a promise there. Um, in Europe, in the United States, uh, in the United States Occupy movement, um, it, has, it has lost its spectacular side. The sort of thing in which Zizek could fly out, fly out to New York and make a speech and so forth. You know, that phase is gone. Um, <clears throat> and what now people like that have seen in the, there is that there really is no alternative to building long-term things of some sort. Uh, <clears throat> let me sort of put it conceptually um, something that I say again and again uh, in various fora. <coughs> the defeat of communism as a world project and the assimilation of social democracy by neoliberalism ended two great lineages revolutionary lineages from the 19th century. So this is the moment of the third one, which is anarchism. This is the moment of Bakunin. Remember in the first international, there's Marx and Engels, and there were Proudhon and Bakunin and their followers, and the basic argument was between Marxists and anarchists. And in my view, they were such opponents of each other because at least in half of what they were saying, they resembled each other. <laughs> um, I think this is the moment in which um, anarchism is rising in various forms or inspired by the anarchist critiques of the old revolutionary projects. New kinds of organizations are arising. 
Um, I have been saying, I have written this, uh, published it, that, look, there was a period in my own lifetime when one third of humanity lived under some kind of a socialist government. That's not a small number. In 1970-75, it was quite clear to me that by the end of my life, at least half the world will be living under socialist governments. So the defeat has not been small. A certain history has ended and it is logical that people who still have revolutionary commitments will try to think how to revive a revolutionary project by not simply repeating but also through invention of various kinds. In other words, we have reached, we have arrived at a period of great radical experimentation. It is not at all clear any longer how socialism is to be built. As it was for the generation of Lenin and Luxembourg and so on, as while those great states existed, in the communist movement certainly, there was an absolute consensus that this is how you build socialism. And then, in whatever way, for whatever reasons, it collapses. So you begin to experiment. Now, <coughs> Zizek's <coughs> problem is that he's very excitable. <laughs> so, if the excitable phase <laughs> is gone, <laughs> you know, if the indignados in their glorious moment are not doing in Spain what they did in those few weeks, then somehow it has all gone in Spain. You know, it's not true. <laughs> you know, the first thing Zizek should know is that every revolutionary beginning has to go through the processes of riots and riots have a short life. They don't last long. Uh, their consequences last. Uprisings cannot be maintained for months and years. They leave consequences. And then the historical process slows down. But the process has been changed. The other thing is that putting all this in one bag, Latin America and Arab Spring and so forth, is a very peculiar way of approaching all this. In Latin America, for example, the motor of all the change is the state. And you can't reverse neoliberalism except through the state. You're not talking of just, pop, you know, popular uprisings, people who have, no, who have neither great big parties nor access to a state, where the state is actually against them, where the state will not let them grow. So the, the Latin American process is of a completely different order than, than this one. And it has longevity. Even if, you know, tomorrow some of the elections may be lost or whatever, but it has created new um, actors in history. The issue of racism in Latin America is as old as the first landing of the Spaniards and the Portuguese on that continent. It took them 400 years to elect the first indigenous president, Eva Morales. The issue of the rights of the indigenous has been posed in Latin America in country after country and is being organized politically 
in ways which are completely historically unprecedented. In countries like Bolivia, Peru, Guatemala, to a certain extent, Ecuador, uh, <coughs> country after country, the, the discussion really is between the socialists and the indigenous. The two polit political forces out there in the field, in the what you might call the left formations. Now, this is a completely new historical agent on, that, on this scale, which these developments have thrown up. Morales may lose the next elections, but the political landscape of, Latin, uh, of Bolivia has been altered. And this is not just, I mean, Leñera, the vice president, has a wonderful theoretical work on this. Right. Um, you know, what, what should be the Marxist understanding of all this? Uh, let's open.